that you all are with us this morning. And I'm excited about our next presentation that Brother Scott Ritzma is going to share with us, Conformed or Transformed Part 1. But before he comes out, I want to let you know that if you have a question, maybe the, some of the presentations that have been presented so far might have caused you to think of a question and you'd like to ask our presenters Whatever that question is, we invite you to scan the QR code and send in your questions, and we will address those questions on Sabbath afternoon in our Q&A session. So I want to let you know about that, and I'm excited about our next presentation, so I'm going to hand the time over to Brother Scott Ritzma. God bless. Be not conformed to this world. But be, what's the next word? Transformed by the renewing of your minds. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the invitation to behold you and become changed. We know that you're doing a work in us if we will cooperate and surrender our will to yours. And that work is to transform us by the renewing of our minds. We do not want to be conformed to this world. And as we study this, this spiritually heavy topic this morning, we ask for discernment, we ask for protection for the presence of your holy angels, and that we might know that we are not on the path of being conformed to the world, but we are fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Romans 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. It presents us a choice, doesn't it? Do you know that your mind is being changed and shaped with everything you do all the time? It's called brain plasticity. Your brain is always changing, not just when you're in the ages of development, grown people as well. I want to put an image on the screen to show two different brain regions, the frontal lobe and the limbic system. These are two regions of the brain that media has an impact upon. And it works like this. First of all, the frontal lobe of your brain is where you have spirituality and morality and exercise of the will, where you have reason and conscience, where you have discernment of spiritual truth, empathy, altruism. Basically, the Christian life very much happens right there in the frontal lobe. On the other hand, the limbic system is where we often get overactive, out-of-control impulses and emotions, fear, stress, lust, anxiety, anger, irritability, negativity, aggression, you name it. How many of you want more of that in your life, by the way? I didn't see a single hand go up. I hope not. We don't want more of that in our lives. We want the frontal lobe stuff, don't we? But guess what happens when you sit down to view theatrical style entertainment television and movies? Let's take that as an example first. You're going to watch a show. You're going to, you're going to binge watch. You're going to watch a Hollywood film. And when you sit down to do that, the frontal lobe is subdued within minutes. The limbic system is activated by, based on the genre of the film or the scene or the musical elements and the dramatic elements that they're trying to get the viewer into. So the limbic system active, active, active. And those circuits then are widening, becoming strengthened. While the frontal lobe, it's kind of like somebody came and took a switch on your frontal lobe and turned it off during that period of viewing. Well, you saw on the, on the graphic one arm that is very muscular and one that is very skinny it's because our brain works like that our brain regions are like muscles the ones that we exercise and use more we will get more of and the ones that we don't will weaken and like a muscle will atrophy and not be as usable and use and, and, and useful so thinking about that from the standpoint of being transformed by the renewing of our minds if we are doing things that enhance and strengthen the frontal lobe of our brain, then that would be wiring those circuits, strengthening those character traits and capacities to serve God and make good choices. But if I'm exercising, overdoing that limbic system, God gave us a limbic system. We are to have elements of, 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 of a healthy appetite and, 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 and good emotions that are coming out of there. But when it's out of control and it is dominating the life and the frontal lobe is handicapped like an arm in a sling that you didn't exercise and didn't do anything with all day every day for weeks and months on end it's going to become useless and the one that you do everything with strengthened i don't want to revert in that temptation in that stressful situation in that fearful situation i don't want to revert to the limbic system i want that frontal lobe to be to be empowered and not incapacitated the Bible speaks of this. It says, if you sow to your own flesh, you will from the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In other words, what we sow to, we will what? 
reap from. The area of our nature, if it's the carnal nature that we're sowing to and encouraging and exercising, we will reap from that and become more of that. But if we sow to the spiritual man where the spirit is giving us victory, we will reap eternal life. I praise God for that. By the way, they also did a study where they looked at video games. And they looked at the brains of young people before they started a week of video games, violent video games in this case. And they wanted to see how does that change their brain when they play just 10 hours. So a little over an hour a day, hour and a half a day, the moderate recommended amount by the experts. And they found in just one week of only 10 hours of video games, over seven days, they found less frontal lobe function at the end of that week. In just one week. So these things start to take their toll pretty quickly. Now, did you notice, by the way, we haven't so much looked at what is the moral quality of our entertainment choices. Usually when we have the media talk as Christians, we focus on that, and we will. We're about to do that. But even the form of media itself, the theatrical style, entertainment, television, and movies that we're viewing, or the violent video games, even if it's not graphic, and I'm the good guys, you know, it's not Grand Theft Auto, you know, we're making better choices, but if those things are affecting our brain in a way that impacts our character, even the moral content of it becomes less relevant at that point, and the form of media itself is hurting the character. Now, what about the morality? It's definitely hitting us hard and fast. 200,000 acts of violence the average young person is viewing by the age of 18. And 6,588 beer commercials. Now my students in class always would say, yeah, but Mr. Ritzma, we don't watch the commercials. We, you know, this is the 21st century after all, ancient man. Um, no, I'm telling you guys, it's not just during the ad breaks that they're advertising. They are advertising to you constantly in propaganda placements, product placements, subliminals. In fact, there were 316,239 times that in primetime television alone, in just one year, they flashed an alcohol product advertisement in the program, embedded in the show. Not as a break, not as an ad at the beginning of the video or something like that. Well, one more fact on this slide. Between the ages of 8 and 18, we're looking at 79,500 scenes of a sexual nature, inappropriate, immoral things. So this is going to take its toll by beholding. We will either be conformed or what? transformed, right? So if I'm beholding Christ and heavenly things and that which is good and true and beautiful, whatsoever things are true and noble and right and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, if I'm beholding that, I'll be transformed into that. Beholding the world, you, you know the rest of the sentence. But the thing is, when I was at this age group, I was a young person, wanting to watch what I wanted to watch, listen to what I want to listen to, play the violent video games, the least of my era in the 90s, I would have looked at those numbers and stats and been like, doesn't matter, it's not going to affect me because I'm not going out and killing somebody, right? I'm not going out and actually committing these acts. So see, I can watch it and be entertained by it and not be touched by it. Ha, you know, that was my bad attitude I had. And what an ignorant attitude because it's so ignorant of the scriptures. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount? Did he say when it comes to murder and adultery, we'll use those as the examples here, did he say all that matters is whether you go out and do the act of murder, do the act of adultery, or did he say something else altogether? He said, you've heard it was said, do not, kill, do not commit adultery. But I say to you what? You know the rest of the, the scripture in Matthew 5? It's even if you are lusting after somebody or hating somebody in your heart, you're stepping on and violating those commandments against Adultery and murder. So what he's getting at is it's, it's the mind that counts. Are we transformed by the renewing of our behavior? Is that what Romans 12 verse 2 says? We are transformed by the renewing of our mind, our heart, our intentions, motives, thoughts. That's where the behavior flows from. So it doesn't matter so much the act. It's really what the character is, is happening inside, what's happening to the character inside. Now, if, if I would have heard this next one about this monkey, I might, have, I might have woken up to the fact, but it's a compelling study. They had a monkey eating peanuts. While the monkey ate peanuts, they did a brain scan of the monkey, and they learned, oh, that's what goes on in a monkey's brain while he eats peanuts. Very interesting. And then they took a break. And the nerdy scientists found that fascinating. Nobody else really was interested in that until... They accidentally discovered with the peanuts sitting over here on the other side of the room now, scientist is eating the peanuts. The monkey is still sitting over here on a break being monitored, not eating peanuts. Remember, they previously recorded his brain while eating peanuts. Now they accidentally, he's watching the peanuts being eaten. They see what a brain scan of the monkey's brain while watching peanuts looks like. 
So they compared the two, and they said, this, this looks strikingly familiar. I, I think we've seen this brain scan before. Yeah, it's the exact same brain scan. The monkey's brain while eating the peanuts was the same as the monkey's brain while watching the peanuts being eaten. What they discovered is what we see with our eyes is interpreted by the brain as if we are doing it ourselves, not merely seeing it. So uh, the 15-year-old version of me stands rebuked by science and by the word of God because it does matter what we behold. You've heard the aphorism. You've heard the phrase. It's the, the theme of this weekend. By beholding, we become changed. Or in the phrase that we're using, changed by beholding. So this is the reality of what's coming our way. And when I heard the story of the Amish young man, it really brought this home for me. How desensitized I had become. This young man had never watched a movie before. He went out and watched the first movie he'd ever seen. It was an old Western film. Now, by today's standards, the Western films are pretty tame, right? I used to show historical films sometimes in my history class when I was a teacher. I wouldn't do that today, but at that time I did, and my students, had, half the class would be asleep about 10 minutes in because it was so slow, and there was some shocking scene like, dun, 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 and they'd laugh at it, the ones who were awake. And so the old Western films, very tame by today's standards. The Amish kid did not fall asleep. He did not laugh. When he saw somebody shot in that Western film in a shootout scene, he turned white, he turned pale, he ran out of the house and threw up. When I heard that true story about the Amish kid, I thought, well, at first maybe he's just Amish and he's weird and that explains everything. But then, no, 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 wait, wait. That's a normal human response of somebody who hasn't been exposed to and desensitized from early childhood of immoral and violent and shocking things. And so his response was the normal human response. He's a little laboratory. We're all the weird ones. We're the frog in the pot. That's like, yeah, this is a good time in here. We're having a good old time. It's nice and warm. Hop in. The pot is warm. And it's slowly heating up. And he doesn't notice it because it's so slow. It's imperceptible because it's so incremental. It's so not throwing him into a pot of boiling water. What happens when you throw the pot, the frog in that pot? He's jumping out of that boiling water. This is crazy. Get out of here. That's the Amish kid who said, that's not entertainment. You guys are nuts that you enjoy that kind of thing. That's probably the normal, at least more biblical response to encountering worldliness. The Bible says, don't sear your conscience as with a hot iron, right? So is this going to have last day's implications? You know, here we are on the ends of of time, on the edge of the ends of time, and we think about a preparation, the needed preparation for the soon coming of Jesus Christ, right? And it's the transformed experience, the beholding and becoming changed experience. And so when I think about a text like Isaiah 33, have you ever studied Isaiah 33? It's a fascinating scripture because it asks a very important question that we're all asking, and it is, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? In other words, who's going to survive that great day when the elements melt with fervent heat and our God, who is a consuming fire, comes and lays waste this earth? Who among us shall stand and dwell with the devouring fire? It's the same question, actually, that's asked in Revelation chapter 6 at the end of the chapter. The second coming of Jesus is pictured, clouds receding as a scroll, and people are running away from him. And they're calling on the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Same question asked in Isaiah 33. Who among us will be able to stand and dwell in that day? Now, in the Revelation account, it just ends. The chapter ends right there. The last words in chapter 6 of Revelation are, who shall be able to stand? So a lot of us read that and we're like, well, that was a nice reading for today. I'm going to go on and, uh, and, and, and go about my business here. But wait a minute. Uh, there were no chapter breaks in the original Bible, and the Bible doesn't raise a rhetorical question that gives no answer. Read on into chapter 7, and you'll actually find the answer to the question, who shall be able to stand? And what's in chapter 7 of Revelation? It's the 144,000 receiving the seal of God in their foreheads. They are the ones that have beheld the lamb. Now, what does Isaiah 33 say? Instead of beholding the lamb, those who will not be able to stand with the consuming fire are those who are beholding bloodshed and evil and immorality. I'll put the scripture up on the screen. It says, who shall be able to 
stand is he who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. What are we looking at? What are we beholding instead then? Christ. And we're before being formed into that same image from glory to glory with a new identity, with a new character, with a new name written on white stone in heaven. So that's Isaiah 33, verse 15, answering the question, who's going to stand amongst the consuming fire? He who stops beholding the things of this world. Now, you could stare at a blank wall and watch paint dry all day, and you're not going to be transformed. So it's implied that if you're stopping looking at this, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Moses couldn't see the face of God. When he said, show me your glory, God said, no one can see my face and live. But if we are beholding Christ and becoming pure in heart, we shall see God. There's a wonderful scripture, or wonderful quotation on this, rather from 1900. It says, Satan's work is to lead men to ignore God, to so engross and absorb the mind that God will not be in their thoughts. The education they have received has been of a character to confuse the mind and eclipse the true light. Satan does not wish the people to have a knowledge of God. Notice this part. If he can set an operation, games and theatrical performances, named specifically 120 plus years ago, these things will so confuse the senses. We read earlier in that paragraph, confuse the mind that human beings, of the young specifically, that human beings will perish in darkness while light shines all about them. He is well pleased. What a tragedy that would be. Light shines all about us. We need to just look and live like the serpent on the pole. But here we are, obsessed with the darkness over here, taking our eyes off of that upon Jesus. Now, by the way, if we need a little incentive to realize what this darkness is, I gotta do the expose with you. We've gotta understand really what the nature and the spiritual allegiances and alliances are in the entertainment industry. We'll do a little history. Let's start with the 1920s, a famous actor, Rudolph Valentino. Where did the movie scripts that Rudolph Valentino starred in come from? Every night, Valentino's wife would hold a seance. Every night, hopefully we're having our devotions every night, our worships every night, because they're serious about this in Hollywood, holding a seance every night, calling forth help from the spirit world in her creative undertaking. Then, pencil and paper in hand, she would go into a trance and start writing. After her outpourings were typed up, they were brought to the set the next day and given to the director. So this was a, 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 a ritual they engaged in to receive the script for the movie from the demonic realm. It continued on in the 1930s with Mae West, Mae West received inspiration from psychic phenomenon. Her psychic recalls that she would pace around the room saying, forces, forces, come to me and help me write a script. She would begin to hear voices and images as the plot was revealed to her. She would lie in bed in a trance-like state, dictating as the spirits entered. So again, very serious. But you fast forward onto our time and you get actors and actresses like Oprah Winfrey and some others. And when they ask her in an interview, tell us about your experience as an actress, she says, well, this is how I see acting. I use my body to be a carrier for the spirits of those who have come before me. And she also said, I tried to empty myself and let the spirit inhabit me. Now, that's not the Holy Spirit. The spirits of those who have come before me are the impersonating demons, impersonating dead people, right? The dead know nothing. So this is demon possession. She's literally describing the spirit inhabits me and my body is a carrier for those spirits. She's not the only one that said such a thing. Peter Sellers said regarding acting, it's rather like being a medium and laying yourself wide open and saying, I want a character to inhabit my body, inhabit my body, or I want a character to take charge of me so that I can produce what I hope to produce. Robin Williams actually used the word possession. He says there's also that thing, it is possession. In the old days, you'd be burned for it, so we know he's talking literal here. But there's something empowering about it. It is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde where you really can become this other force. Tragically, sadly, his career was ended and cut short by suicide. He was not empowered. Imagine what he could have done for God with the charisma of all these people that we're hearing from here. And they're sold out to these demon spirits that are inhabiting them that their body is a carrier for, or in his word, possessed. Uh, one of my favorite actors when I was into Hollywood was Denzel Washington. And I later learned that a movie that I watched actually in a Christian school, it was a history movie, just like uh, Oprah Winfrey's was. It was about people that lived before uh, the, in the slave states in America and she was being possessed by supposedly those spirits. Well, Denzel Washington was also in a history a film about American history, and he, was, he did this scene. The critics were like, it's the greatest scene of the year. You were so in charge. How did you do such a great job? And he said, well, here's how I was so in charge. Basically, what I did was sort of 
communicated with the Spirit. I got on my knees and sort of communicated with the Spirit. So he's literally getting on his knees before the Spirit. And, and when I came out, I was in charge. I couldn't have acted that. I couldn't have made a decision to play that part. So here he's really admitting his, his allegiance, his subservience, his fealty, his, his, his uh, bowing before these spirits. And then he gets some help, doesn't he? Because he says, they, I, I couldn't have acted that. I couldn't have done that. That's how I was so in charge. I communicated with the spirits on my knees. Um, there's some quotations also from the music industry. But before I quote the music industry, I just show you this grainy image from 1998. October 31, 1998, when I told you that I loved the world as a teen. I want to share that with you as a, a matter of testimony and also as a matter of maybe some credibility that when it comes to the expose on the music industry, this is something that I loved. So, and you're wondering, why, what, what's with the demonic attire? It was October 31. This, by the way, side note, this was at a church. This was when we were the, this is when we got saved, so-called, and we're a Christian band. And the, the church said, well, let's have a youth meeting, kind of like we're having youth meetings, right? And we'll let them have a party for Halloween. And it'll be uh, the barn bash. And we went to the barn and had this big old event and played the worldly crazy music. And it was all under this, this heading of, of Christian, which was such a farce as I look back. I mean, you can tell by the imagery and the attire there. But anyway, enough said on that. Aleister Crowley is probably the most influential figure in forming the ideology of the music industry. His famous quotation is, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Now we know the whole of the law is love your neighbor as yourself, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and then all the law and the prophets are hanging from those two great commandments, right? Well, he says, no, contraire. The whole of the law is just doing whatever you want to do. Well, that's just simply lawlessness, right? That's simply rebellion. That's the serpent of old called the, 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 the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who has come in with great wrath, hating God's law, hating the moral statutes of the divine. And he comes in and says, "No, you can do whatever you want to do." Now, um, this is an amazing quotation that's predictive, and it's from the Great Controversy, written over a hundred years ago. And it makes this prediction about what kind of spiritualism, occult communications are going to be coming through in the last days. It says, "And to complete his work, Satan declares through the spirits." So that's the chapter on spiritualism. Here's what Satan declares. True knowledge places man above all law. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, right? That whatever is, is right, that God doth not condemn, and that all sins which are committed are innocent. I want you to remember that, that there's no sin. All sin is innocent. When the people are thus led to believe that desire is the highest law, I want you to remember that too. Spiritualism will teach that desire is the highest law and that there are no sins. Now let's look at some of these musicians moving forward quickly here. The Beatles, actually, John Lennon said in an interview, the whole Beatle idea, what's your ideology? What's your worldview? What's your message? What's your belief system? Do what you want, right? Do what thou wilt. Okay, so he's quoting somebody. They actually put um, Aleister Crowley right on the cover of the album as well. He's up at the top left of that grainy image there. But um, they said, these are people we admire and like. So the biggest band of all times, they came out and said, the whole Beatle idea, like you want to understand our message, is do what thou wilt. Direct quote using the old English and everything. Another band from that time called Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page of that band said, I feel Crowley is a misunderstood genius of the 20th century. So this isn't subtle, you know, you don't have to play the record backward. He's just like, Crowley's a genius. His whole thing was liberation of the person. What you want to do, do it. I've employed his system in my own day-to-day -day life, and that is the way big names are made these days. So how are the big names made in the entertainment industry? Employing Crowley's system, according to Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. Crowley's admirers are really across the board from the 60s and 70s and 80s from these major bands and names, the biggest names, as Jimmy Page said. And Michael Jackson, of course, probably the biggest name of that era, of the 80s. I have my own secret room with a moving wall and mirrors. That's where I talk to Lee, the famous piano player Liberace, who had died. So he's communicating with the dead. His is the voice I hear in there. I feel his presence so very close to me. By the way, the moving wall and mirrors thing, that was 
actually a technique taught by Aleister Crowley that Michael Jackson was participating in. So the, the people on the screen from the previous slide are people in interviews, and they're in their lyrics singing about, I love Mr. Crowley, and I'm wearing his uniform, and all of these things. So this is not some subtle, like, conspiratorial theorizing that it takes to extract a Crowleyan ideology in the music industry. It is front and center and open for all to see. And it continues on to our day. You get the hip hop and the pop music like a Jay-Z. He put the do what thou wilt straight on his sweatshirts. It goes back about 15 years now, but that was not subtle either. Right on his own clothing line in Old English script with quotation marks around it. So somebody on the internet put him next to Crowley and said they must be the dynamic duo. Now you remember in the quotation from the great controversy, what were the two things I told you to remember? There are no sins. And desire is what we live by. Listen to Jay-Z's song. Now we're not going to listen to it, but look at these lyrics from Jay-Z's song, um, No Church in the Wild. I live by you, desire. Well, that's, did he read the great controversy? That's straight out of the prediction that this is what spiritualism would teach. Loving desire, your love, he's speaking to and per personifying desire here. I live by you, desire. Your love is my scripture. We formed a new religion. No sins. Oh, I've heard that somewhere too. Great controversy, page 555. It says there's going to be no sins in the, the teachings of spiritualism. But they add, as long as there's permission, they're talking about consensual arrangements of immorality, fornication, adultery. So that's obviously licentiousness, permissiveness, and, and lustful immorality morality. He says love is cursed by monogamy. Now what is monogamy? Monogamy is the biblical marital fidelity, one man, one woman commitment in marriage. Monogamous marital relationships. But what they're saying is love, which we have to put in big fat scare quotes there because it's not love that they're talking about. If it's cursed by Mon monogamy. They're saying God's design for marital love is a curse to our version of love, which is just those things I mentioned, lust and so on. And it's something that the pastor don't preach. Amen. That's one line in the song that we can totally get on board with because the pastor ain't preaching this false gospel of spiritualism. And they said, we formed a new religion. No, you didn't. You just got this from Satan. He formed it in heaven, rebellion. So it, it's not some new thing. It's, uh, it's, it's loving your own desires, and it's following that. That is the message of the music industry, straight out of the beast of Aleister Crowley, out of, the, out of, out of his dark heart. Now, I want to ask, though, from, from a non-Crowleyan angle here, who's the musician behind the music? Who was the one in heaven that was actually endowed with, with, with divinely ordained musical abilities? He was, he was endowed with the timbrels and pipes. In Ezekiel 28, you read about him in Isaiah 14. Have you read about Lucifer? He actually had musical abilities and led the heavenly choirs. And when he falls and becomes Satan, he distorts everything that God had given to him but still retains those abilities. So it's probably going to be no surprise what we're about to see, that much of the music industry comes directly, not just through Crowley, but directly from Satan. I'm going to share with you Robert Johnson, the guy who invented the rock and roll style guitar. This got it all started. In the 1930s, preceding the rock and roll movement, he invented the rhythm and blues style that had come out of the blues scene, where he actually was known as a talentless guitarist. You never would have heard of Robert Johnson. Then he became the most famous thing of his time. But he was talentless, according to his mentor, the famous blues musician Sun House. Then he became the greatest musical innovator of his time. How? How did that happen? Well, his mentor says... He, he sold his soul to the devil to be able to play like that. That's a direct quote. He sold his soul. To, okay, so apparently he got some help, just like these other actors and so on were saying that they got some help. Um, the, the story goes that he was at the crossroads of 61 and 49 in Clarksdale, Mississippi, which you can still go to. I don't recommend it, but people still go there as like a, a, a shrine to the origins of the popular music industry in the Western world. It was Robert Johnson there who made that deal with the devil and committed his life to the service of Satan. And still musicians go there today and they gather some gravel from it and it's like a little memento on their, on their, um, their, their, their altar at home unto this evil, evil religion. Um, little Richard became one of the, if you will, king of rock and roll of his time. He said, I was directed and commanded by another power the power of darkness that a lot of people don't believe exists, the power of the devil, Satan. Okay, was he clear in that quote? This is, this is not, this is not uh, muddy, this is not fuzzy. He's like, I was directed and commanded by the devil, Satan. In fact, the quote kind of sounds like Revelation 12. The serpent of old called the devil and Satan, the devil, Satan. 
And when I read that quote a number of times years ago, as I was presenting these messages, I thought, that sounds like Revelation 12. And then people started coming up to me and telling me, Brother Ritzema, do you realize he was Seventh-day Adventist Christian? He knew Revelation. You know Seventh-day Adventists. They know their Bible prophecy. At least we ought to. We believe in it. We teach it. We study it. And he knew these things. And he had family members coming to him saying, why are you participating in this when you've told the media that you're serving Satan? And his answer was, got to pay the bills. I got that second hand from somebody who talked to his niece who was the one that confronted him on this. This is 40 years ago, but 50 years ago, I don't know exactly, it's decades ago. Well, the, the wonderful thing, the reason I'm telling his story is because he, on, 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 on 3ABN, TV, uh, satellite TV, he went on with an interview before he died. And he repented of and confessed all of that and said, I'm with Jesus. And he was a converted man. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, you can, be, you can really be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It seems like this thing is like a vortex. This thing is like a black hole that just sucks everything into it. Satan just laughs and has victory. No, he doesn't. He's a defeated foe. He knows his time is short. We can break free from that like this just by going to Jesus and throwing ourselves into his loving arms. He's invited us. He wants us. He pleads for us to come. It took him a little while, but at the end of the day, he was that thief on the cross, wasn't he? John Lennon of the Beatles said... I felt like a hollow temple filled with many spirits, each one passing through me, each inhabiting me. Does this sound familiar like those actors and actresses? We're being inhabited by spirits. He says, each one is inhabiting me for a little time and then leaving to be replaced by another. Then he goes on and says about the writing of his songs, just like the scripts in the movie and in the Hollywood industry were written under seances and directions from demons. He says, the, about the writing of his songs. He says, I don't know who the blank writes it. I'm just sitting and the whole blank song comes out. Wait a minute. The Beatles, the biggest band right there. Their, their music is the anthem of a generation. Their music is the soundtrack of a culture. And these guys didn't know who wrote their songs? That is, that is like headline news right there. Beatles didn't write their own songs and doesn't know who wrote them. They were filled with spirits, each one passing through them, each one inhabiting them for a little time to be replaced by another. This should be well-known information. Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones said something very similar. Songs, yeah, they think you wrote it. Wait, you didn't write your songs either. He says, really, you are just a medium, like being at a seance. Songs come to me en masse. I didn't do anything except to happen to have been awake when it arrived. So he didn't write them either. And same thing with Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page and Robert Plant of that band also explained how they received the song Stairway to Heaven and other music, referring to themselves as a musical medium. Channeling the music. Those are occult terms right there, being a medium and channeling. Um, they said that the music was offered to them. And Robert Plant specifically stated, my hand started writing, I almost leapt out of my seat. Now that's not normal, right? I don't think you've ever been talking to somebody and they were like, hey, yeah, the other day, I was sitting there and my hand just started writing and it startled me so that I almost leapt out of my seat. That's not normal. That's automatic writing. That's channeling. That's demonic of what these guys were into. The band Cream said how they're playing their instruments, same thing. It happens to us quite often. It feels as though I'm not playing my instrument. Something else is playing it, and that same thing is playing all three of our instruments. That's what I mean when I say it's frightening sometimes. We'll, we'll all play the same phrase out of nowhere. It happens very often with us. So they were saying, literally, it feels like I'm not playing it. Something else is playing it. I met somebody who actually had that experience, by the way. She was a, a Christian godly lady who had been straying from her faith, and she was a really, really talented piano player, and she was hiring out her services to play the piano for one of the kind of, you know, uh, more, more ecstatic types of, uh, of worship services at the, at the church down the road. And, you know, kind of the hooping and hollering and, you know, flopping in the aisles sort of, sort of scene. And she knew how to play that in a way that could get people like Wah! you know just losing their mind she played so well as the music is, is really what generates a lot of that and in the midst of that it, it was when she heard this quote she came up to me and told me this story she's like I stopped doing it one Sunday morning because I realized I heard the voice of an angel the Lord spoke whatever I'm, I'm, I'm got the people really really um you know into this frenzy and I hear an audible voice that says you realize you're not the one playing right now don't you and that frightened her that she realized she was a part of something that was not of God. And she got up and got out of there. And everybody's like, well, where'd the piano player go? But she never went back. 
So um, those are some older examples, of course, from the 60s and stuff, but modern example, a good one is Beyonce. The graphic imagery here on her album cover from about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, is very informative because here she is on the left with a cross hanging from her wrist, right? And she's got Beyonce. But then she morphs into this alter ego called Sasha Fierce with no cross from the wrist, instead horns on the head and what looks like some type of goat skull image there. But let's not just go on the imagery. Let's hear what she has to say. When I see a video of myself on stage or TV, I'm like, who is that girl? That's not me. I wouldn't dare do that. I created my stage persona to protect myself so that when I go home, I don't have to think about what it is I do. Sasha is not me. I wouldn't like Sasha if I met her off stage. So is it just an act? It's not. She goes on and says, I have someone else that takes over when I'm on stage. So that sounds like all the quotes we've been hearing through these many slides that preceded this one, that there is literal demonic possession, at least influence, taking over her when she's on stage. When I'm on stage, I'm not afraid of my sexuality. The tone of my voice gets different, and I'm fearless. It's just a different per I'm just a different person. Things I do when performing, I would never do normally. Now listen to this. I have out-of-body experiences. If I cut my leg, if I fall, I don't even feel it. I'm not aware of my face or my body. Again, that's not normal. I've never heard somebody tell me like the other day, I just wasn't aware of my face or my body and I would cut down, or fall down and cut myself and I wouldn't feel it. This is dark, demonic, spiritual things that these people are into. There's no doubt about it. And it happens when you literally put on the ring. And it's the Baphomet goat skull image at the MTV Video Music Awards many years ago, which you can see the, the, the image of the satanic goat god symbolism from paganism and the church of satan there that's exactly what she had on and then she did the eye symbolism and then she was at the super bowl and did the triangle the eye inside the triangle thing and when it was at the super bowl that was significant that was that was highly significant because the super bowl according to madonna who's the high priestess of the music industry the super bowl is the holy of holies of american culture according to madonna I believe in a holy of holies happening right now where I go in faith and behold Jesus Christ blotting out my sins in the sanctuary and receiving unto him the church of God without stain or wrinkle or any such thing. And so that's the real holy of holies. But to the music industry, the Super Bowl is the holy of holies of American culture. And then Madonna also went on and said, I'm going to come in at the halfway point of the church experience and I will deliver the sermon. That's what the halftime show of the Super Bowl is. It's a sermon of the occult, according to Madonna. And so when, when, when Beyonce did the triangle there, I remember reading in the mainstream media and they were like, oh, you silly conspiracy people. All she was doing was promoting her husband's record company because Jay-Z does the symbol of the LCI and they're like, ah, it's just a record company thing. It's just business. You know, it's nothing, nothing occult here happening. Move along. And, and I, that's kind of my default actually is to move along because it's kind of silly, right? Symbolism and all the, 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 what is this, a secret handshake and some, you know, secret society and conspiracy theory. So I get it, the desire to move along. But when you understand the occult, they actually do believe in the symbolism. It is power to them. It is their way of communication. So you kind of have to understand their world and, 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 and see what they're actually trying to say there. Well, what are they actually trying to say with that symbol? It, by the way, if, if all she was doing was promoting her husband's record company, doesn't that just beg the question, why is he using the symbolism? It's like the media just kind of, you know, expects us to be that, you know, the, the, that lack of uh, reasoning capacity. But it wasn't just these two. The eye symbolism exploded like 15 or 20 years ago. Everybody started doing that symbolism, right? Where did that all come from? Now, we could take one of two paths here. We could do the uh, like 85-part YouTube series exposing every secret of the Illuminati in Hollywood and watching all sorts of graphic you know, videos and listening to it. And I'm like, I think I'll, I think I'll pass on that. So I'm going to answer, the, uh, not me, Carlos Santana is going to answer the all-seeing eye in the music industry question in one slide. So I'll save you a lot of time today. Do you appreciate that? You don't need to chase the conspiracy rabbit trails. Here's the answer in one slide. He gives it to you. Carlos Santana says, in my meditations... The entity called Metatron said, okay, so he's got my attention. He's speaking to an entity in meditations. The entity has a name. This is a demonic figure, a Satan himself, who says to him, we want to hook you back to the radio airwave frequency to reach, notice this young people, junior high schools, high schools, and universities. Does Satan know about the army of youth that's written about in the book Education? Does Satan know how the hastening of the second coming of Jesus will transpire because of an active agency of young people? He knows. He fears your generation. 
And so he's trying to disrupt it by getting things going here. What is he getting going? Once you reach them, we want you to present them with a new form of existence. And then we see Metatron is represented by the eye inside the triangle in a subsequent Rolling Stone interview that Santana did. And that this Metatron wants Santana's listeners to, quote, remember your divinity. Oh, there's your new, there's your new form of existence. You are a divine being said Satan, right? You will be like God, he said to Eve. And it's the same message today. What is do what thou wilt? It's your God unto yourself. You're making your own law. You're making your own rule rather than being uh, submissive to the law of God. So this is no surprise. This is not some shocker. When they're doing all this weird symbolism and doing all kinds of occult things, it's simply the same message all along since the Garden of Eden, the deception, the lie of Satan, that you are your own God. You don't need to serve and submit to to the love and the law of God. And the way I just phrase that, can I, can I, can I hit rewind and, and revise? You don't need to. You don't have to. That's Satan's way of thinking about it, isn't it? Did God really say you can't eat from any tree of the garden? Oh, come on. He's the one that is picturing God as holding out on you, as excessively restrictive, as a tyrant, as, as taking away your fun and not wanting you to have a good time. What did we see last night and how to escape the pleasure trap? That's Satan, the one that wants us miserable. He's the one that brings depression. He's the one that brings addiction and every addiction leads to more depression. God's the one that gives us the abundant life. He's the one that says, just taste and see. Just taste and see that the Lord is good. Test me in these things and see if I don't open the floodgates of blessing upon you. Let's go to another section here. And we thought they were okay. Now those guys on the screen, we didn't think were okay because they're all psychedelic drug rock and weird death metal and all of that. It, it looks evil. They're trying to look evil, right? But these two on the screen are totally innocent looking, aren't they? Sammy Davis Jr. and Sting. These are two guys that you'd find at the dentist office in the waiting room. You know what? Light rock. It's acceptable. It's tolerable. It's, it's very, very uh, decent. Respectable conventionality, maybe you'd call it. The guy on the top left, Sammy Davis Jr., even though he looks like he's singing special music at church, I know, I get it, but this guy was the most voracious advocate of Aleister Crowley of any other bunch on the screen. And Sting, in an interview, he said, I've got this deck of cards, tarot cards, designed by Aleister Crowley himself. The death card is my favorite. Like, that guy does not look like he's into death stuff, but that's what he's into. Do what thou wilt, by the way, is a phrase you'll find or in so many words in different poetic phraseologies through the music industry. And, and so in the full set version of this, I have just quote after quote after quote from the music industry. We skipped that. But I want to give you the one that shocks people because it's like hokey, old-fashioned, not very cutting-edge, cool, rebellious Frank Sinatra I did it my way. That song is, according to Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, he said that was the most satanic song of the 20th century. Not, not Marilyn Manson, not uh, Jay-Z. It, it's, well, he's 21st century, but you get the idea. Um, so under this heading of end, we thought they were okay. Let me quote this band. You might know them historically, uh, but you're going to be shocked who it is. Uh, we were doing witchcraft, trying to do witchcraft music, and then they also said, I'm doing the spiritual sound, a white spiritual sound, religious music. That's the whole movement. That's where I'm going. It's going to scare a lot of people. So what dark odious, ominous figure said such a thing. It was just these happy-go-lucky guys, you know. <laughs> the Beach Boys, we're just singing about going surfing and riding in your car. It's totally innocent. Actually, they were doing witchcraft. I would not have looked at that clean-cut, you know, <laughs> young, fine young gentleman. I would not have looked at that and been like, clearly, this is witchcraft. But when they tell me, I've got to believe it. I've got to listen. When I was listening to all the most rebellious music in the 90s, there were some decent kids at my school, the girls particularly, who were trying to be Christian, kind of. They, they would listen to like Tori Amos and, and Sarah McLachlan. And then I later learned this about Tori Amos. She sang a song called Father Lucifer. And she stated in an interview, I wanted to marry Lucifer. I don't consider Lucifer an evil force. I feel his presence with the music. I feel like he comes and sits on my piano. No comment needed there. She wanted to marry Lucifer. He's not evil. Um, Sarah McLaughlin had a song, a very nice sounding song, actually. It almost sounds sacred. And it's about an angel in the arms of the angel. Well, which angel is she singing about? She says, I think the devil has gotten a bad rap. The devil is the fallen angel, the one who was willing 
to embrace the dark side, whereas all the other angels were in total denial. The devil is more like us. That is convoluted logic, but she is actually kind of up to speed on the great controversy a little bit, isn't she? She knows that Satan is a fallen angel. You got a lot of theologians and people in Christianity that doesn't know where Satan came from, but she knows, and she knows which side she's on too, doesn't she? Now, if you were looking at American history text right now, what decade of the last hundred years, we, we saw 20s and 30s, you know, that the music industry, or the movie industry rather, and the, the seances and everything, and then we've seen the more modern times, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and on to our time. But what de decade did I leave out? It's, it's the family values decade in your U.S. history textbook. It's the decade of the sitcoms like Leave It to Beaver with this really awesome father, really great man. Ward Cleaver was his name. There was a show actually called Father Knows Best. So it's family values central, right? Maybe that's even over the top, but maybe not. But we need, we need a little dose of that these days, I think, about validating fathers. But anyway, you look at that decade and you're like, moving on, it was totally pure as the wind-driven snow, Right? Well, this was the decade when televisions were coming into American homes. And I want to show you one sitcom that I didn't mention. I mentioned the Leave it to Beaver. I watched Lassie as a kid, the reruns of that. But there was this one show called I Love Lucy, and they've got seance happening in that show. And actually, it was the spirit of actress Carol Lombard who guided Lucille Ball into taking a chance and accepting the offer to star in I Love Lucy. The glamorous comedian who had died in an airplane crash in 1942 appeared to Lucy in 1951. Because Lucille Ball, and that wasn't her, of course, that was a demonic impersonation. Because Lucille Ball accepted the spirit's urging to take a chance, honey, she made television history. So 1950s, decent entertainment was being arranged behind the scenes by demonic apparitions, appearances, and arrangements. That's an amazing thing. Now, when it comes to Disney, this one really is where everybody's bubble get, gets collectively burst. I was a major Disney lover as a kid, and this was one of my favorites. Aladdin probably was my favorite. And then I look back on it. I got to give credit to Little Light Ministry, by the way. They got a whole documentary on, uh, on Disney, fantastic expose on this. And so some of what I'm about to share is pulled from that. But um, Aladdin is the professional thief. That's what he does for a job. He steals. And then you got this young lady, Jasmine, who's the daughter of the king. The father, king figure, is a bumbling little doofus. And she is going to leave her father and go with Aladdin, who comes only to steal and kill and destroy, to quote the Bible about, about the devil. And then he takes her out and sings to her, no one to tell us no or where to go. What do you translate that into? Do what thou wilt, right? No one to tell us no or where to go. And then he also takes her up. This is where it gets kind of interesting. You, some people got, like to get into the symbolism. If this, is, if this is for you, take it. Otherwise, just evaluate. But this is kind of interesting to me. It's straight up, no one to tell us no. That's all I need, and I'm done with Disney. But the symbolism is interesting. He takes her up on a high elevation on a magic carpet. And we should just do away with that at magic, right? We don't do the Harry Potter and the occult and the magic stuff. But Disney, they get away with it because Mickey was so cute with his wizard hat doing Fantasia, right? Come on now. We've got to be fair. We've got to be honest. We've got to be objective. But he's on the magic carpet, and he, he sings to her from a high elevation. Bible students, maybe Matthew 4? From a high elevation, he says to her, I can show you the world, and it's splendid. And Satan took Jesus up on a high mountain and showed him the world in its splendor. Showed him the world in its splendor. I can show you the world, and it's splendid. Then he ascends above the clouds. You see on the image there, I will ascend above the clouds, said Lucifer in Isaiah 14. And there's another line in the song that's like a hint, hint, wink, wink moment where he sings this. I'm like a shooting star. I'm like a shooting star. Star in the Bible represents an angel, right? A shooting star, would that be one that fell or one that stayed in heaven? I'm like a shooting star. I've come so far, I can't go back to where I used to be. That's word for word from the song, A Whole New World. That's a description of the fall of Lucifer. That's eye-opening stuff there. I wouldn't always try to piece things together if they're not, but this is kind of in your face. And the clincher for me to at least present the evidence, leave people free to decide is where we go here. He swoops down into a garden. He plucks a piece of fruit and he hands it to Eve. I'm sorry, her name is Jasmine, not Eve. I don't know how I make that mistake every time, but there she is. She's going to eat, am I going to eat the fruit? How, how, you couldn't get more clear than that, could you? And then she goes, and then he sings this to her. I can open your eyes, and your eyes will be open, knowing good and evil, Satan said to Eve in the garden. Then we get 2013. There's just no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Do you believe that? 
I think most people who watch this and appreciate this and are fans of this don't actually believe that. That's a lie of the devil. There's no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Now, um, we might be able to identify many things in the entertainment industry that are clearly demonic and spiritual, but spiritualism. But what really got my attention is an insider, Feruza Balk, who she says there's actually a lot of people, a lot of entertainers who don't mention their names, of course, who are very much into this, and this meaning witchcraft. So I think we can have something better, can't we? What did, Je what did Jesus say to Adam and Eve? He said, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat. There's one tree over here called the entertainment industry. You don't want to touch it. But don't obsess on that. Don't focus on that. Turn our eyes upon Jesus and be changed by beholding. Amen. And then, when we realize there's a risk here, it makes it all the more logical. Do you know what I mean by a risk? As soon as I hear from Feruza Bog that a lot of actors who aren't saying what their allegiances are, are very much into this, I go, well, you know what? I was thinking maybe as long as I avoid the ones here, like on a buffet, you know, I'm going to a buffet, and there's some healthy food and some unhealthy, and I, you know, the ones that are confirmed as unhealthy, I'll go ahead and not eat those. That's the smart, logical, conscience thing to do. But it's not all bad, right? I mean, it's not. There's probably some decent people in there in Hollywood. It's not all bad. But then it's kind of like this analogy. Somebody comes to you from the kitchen and taps you on the shoulder, and her name is Feruza Balk. And she goes, now, I know the people that made the food. And I know that some of this that you thought was okay, under the heading we had earlier, and we thought they were okay, a lot of this is confirmed to have poison in it, even though it looks healthy. It's a carrot dish. It's spinach or whatever. Well, I wasn't going to eat the carrots and the spinach anyway, but here, I'm here to tell you a lot of this buffet, as she said there, a lot of these actors are very much into witchcraft. She was in a witchcraft movie at the time, and that's what they were asking her about. So when I hear that from the inside source, I have to kind of take their word for it and go, okay, the risk here is not worth it because what I'm finding here is not what I find here. What I find in the service of Jesus Christ is that which is true and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. And by beholding that, I will not be conformed into this dark image of rebellion that will take its toll and will influence like a monkey watching peanuts being eaten. What are we beholding? It's a challenge each of us has to ask ourselves, and the Holy Spirit is asking each of us. God is preaching to me while he's preaching to you through the Holy Spirit. Will we come away from a weekend like this and go right back to our marginal things that we just kind of want to get away with? Or the things we're dabbling with that we know are wrong, that we know are not what Jesus would do if he was in my shoes. When I am walking with Jesus and I have a relationship with him and I recognize his presence with me throughout the day, it just prohibits an awful lot of folly and foolishness and dark things and, and, and rebellion. And if I fall, if I fail, if I struggle, if I do something wrong, he is right there to pick me up. He doesn't leave you comfortless. He will come to you. But I'll tell you something. From last night, when we saw how to escape the pleasure trap, it is hard. I've been there, I know. It is hard to forsake the things of the world that we have loved to consume that are stimulating our taste buds, that we're addicted to. It is, it's like ripping a Band-Aid off. And the, Jesus actually tells us this in the book of John. He says, you will grieve and you will mourn while the world rejoices. Everybody else seems to be having a big old party and I have a conscience on this matter and I've had to have convictions on that matter and the Lord has called me apart on that and now people look at me like I'm some kind of misfit, like I'm not welcome, like I'm not cool, like I'm not a part of whatever. Do I want to be a part of that? I wanna, I want, what do the angels think is cool? Have you ever wondered that? Are you interested in fitting in down here with, with, with rebellion and evil? Are you interested in, in, in the fashions and coolness and trends of this very temporary and very degenerate age? What is it like in heaven? I want to be into that trend, that, if you will, what's cool. I don't think they probably speak in those terms, but just kind of what, how we do things up there. I want to be preparing for that now. And when I make that break, I know it's hard. The rest of the verse, though, says you're your mourning, your grief will be turned into joy. God will fulfill the desires of your heart. 
he will give you abundantly beyond anything you can ask or imagine. And I'm talking in this world. If we are saying, I want none of that, I want Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have this world. If I make that commitment and I toss something out and I'm removing things from my video library, my music library, my video games, whatever, you got to replace it with something better. Because if, if, if a man comes in and has a demon cast out of him and all he does is sweep his house and put it in order, what, what does that demon go do? Gets seven more, more wicked than himself, and they come in and occupy the place. And the final state of that man is worse than it was to begin with, right? So fill the life with of these things you may freely eat. There is so much to do with our time, with our media choices, with non-media things that can be replacing that which is of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the truth as it is in Jesus, that we can behold him and become changed. And we're maybe facing a valley of decision right now, and it feels like a valley of the shadow of death, to come out of something that we've loved, but we know that it's only light at the end of that tunnel, that after a period of withdrawal, you give us such delight as in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delight. And I just pray for that, that peace, that assurance that when we have a conviction and we follow through as led by you and as empowered by you to overcome, that we will, that we will be rewarded, that we'll be rewarded with a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, that we will know you more and have the confidence and assurance that we are heaven bound. So Jesus, give us a mission, give us a purpose, not to live for entertainment, but to live as the army of youth to finish this work. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Hi friends, the program you just watched was recorded at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church where I serve as lead pastor. We'd love to meet you. If you're ever in the Sacramento area, come and worship the Lord with us. We'll meet you in the lobby and shake your hand.
Hi friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor. It's time to make your plans and mark your calendars to attend our third annual Amazing Facts Youth Conference. The dates are June 7th through the 10th, 2023. This year's mission and title is called Identity, Change by Beholding. Come and learn how to turn your focus from the world to the Word and make some great friends along the way. For more information about the speakers and how you can register, go to afyouth.com. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible Study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at aftv.org. At aftv.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit aftv.org. Another edition of the Sabbath School Study Hour right here in the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Pastor Sean Brumman and I have the privilege of teaching our lesson study here today. Uh, it's so good to be able to have you join us here in our local church in the metropolitan Sacramento area of California.